feel like when I get together with you on Sunday that I'm meeting with my managers. Not my managers, but managers. Amen. I hope you've appreciated, you know, God just gives me insight as I go along and ways to describe what the Bible teaches. And I found that, that thinking of the kingdom of God, and remember he said the kingdom of God is within you. And uh, the Lord gave pastors and evangelists, different ones that said, to teach and said for the perfecting of the saints and for the ministry. So uh, the, as we go along, we learn how we fit. It's like a puzzle almost. We fit. And that's why I'm calling you a manager now. See, we're not just saved to be saved. We're saved to serve. <laughs> and that's what makes you a manager. Because Jesus said, as the Father sent me, even so I send you. So God has uh, commissioned us. He's instructed us to go forth into the fields. And the harvest is ripe, he said, and for us to go and do the work that he calls us to do. Not everybody can do it the same way. I saw something on TV the other day, and I don't know where it was, someplace in, 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 the, in the United States. But anyhow, a lady and three or four big guys are all with her, and they were walking through some mall, and they were saying all kinds of things about the Lord. You know, you better repent. You're going to hell and all that. So, I mean, I know that a lot of you couldn't, you wouldn't have the nerve to do that. You'd just be embarrassed to do that or whatever. So, everybody's different. You know, not everybody can go out in the street like Salvation Army does and get a big horn and play, you know, and witness personally in the street. But God helps all of us to find a way to serve Him in the kingdom. We are managers, after all. And, uh, you know, if, a, if when a large company or even a small company will say, well, when a large company, uh, hires managers, you know, they're, or they're hiring people to be in charge of certain areas, and they're, they're, they're given a workload. This is what we expect out of you. This is the load. We want you to come in this hour, and blah, blah, and this will do this and this. You're responsible for this and that and so on. So I believe the Bible is just clear to us that as managers of the kingdom, we have specific roles to fill. Not everybody can do it the same way I do it, and I wouldn't want you to try it. Probably wouldn't work for you. <laughs> everybody has to be themselves and pray that the Lord will use them. But uh, so that is the perspective that we're looking at as we look at the Scriptures in regard to carrying on in the work of the kingdom of God. Now, we often stress, now today's going to, you know, today I'm going to give you, I have a code of conduct today for managers. So I'll be getting, I mentioned it the other week, but I didn't get to it, but I'm going to get to it today. But we often stress that we presently live under the ebullience of God's grace and are therefore emancipated from the bondage of rules. Now, you have to be very careful on this kind of teaching because it gets into greasy grace. We all believe in God's grace, but when we stretch it beyond its its uh, limitations, then we're getting into difficult ground. And I'll explain as we go along. While grace, the grace of God, liberates us from the yoke of Old Testament law, all those rigorous laws that we men could not keep, we are now liberated to serve under a new covenant. Now remember, there's two covenants, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Testament and the New Testament. Each of them have a role to play. We cannot discount the value of the Old Testament. I think basically when you see the rigorous rules and laws and what people had to go through and how fast God would punish people by the thousands if they didn't carry out exactly to the finite measure how they were penalized and so on, I think you'd have to understand the degree of the egregiousness, the seriousness of man's sin. When man sinned and spit in God's face after God gave him the Garden of Eden, gave him a covenant. I mean, we look at it, we say, well, Adam and Eve sinned and sinned past for all men. But what that entails is that God begins to teach us, I believe in the Old Testament, people can look at it different if they want to, but as I've searched the Old Testament, I believe that as we see that severe, 
stringency. And we see all that, how man had to do all kinds of things. I mean, there were so many rules and regulations. I don't know how they kept up with them. So in that sense, God has undertaken by grace, and he fulfilled that law. Now, notice the Bible doesn't say he destroyed the Old Testament. He fulfilled it, because no one else could. But he fulfilled the entire Old Testament, all those commands. So understand that even though we're saved by grace, and you, not of works, lest any man should boast, even under a new covenant, as I'm trying to drive home here, we have not been given a license to become intransigent to commit sin through the new birth. I don't know how you could ever explain to anyone that adultery is sin before you're saved. But after you're saved, somehow you're immune now. I mean, it's nonsense. The Bible says if we sin, then the Bible says if a man say is not, he's a liar. Sin is present all around us, and chances are all of us sin every day. Hopefully not on purpose, but whatever, I mean, times come, we're, we, we come short of the glory of God. We just, we're not perfect, so obviously that's going to happen. But for us to think that we can go on in the life of sin and debauchery, and now that we're saved, that somehow we're immune from the penalty of sin, it's just, it just goes beyond my, my imagination. I just can't hardly figure how a person could think that. But here's what has happened. It's true, we do not have to live under those rigorous laws that were in the Old Testament. Jesus came and fulfilled them. But when Jesus came, he introduced to us a new covenant. Well, there's some regulations in the new covenant, believe it or not. <clears throat> I mean, for you to think you just can live slippery <clears throat> and just because you live in the new covenant, in, in the time of the new covenant, that God doesn't require anything of you. I'm going to explain to you, so stay, don't leave yet, because if you leave, then I'll think, uh-oh. I know where that person's coming from. I know who they've been listening to. <laughs> I can tell right away how you act. But here's the difference. Now, even though there are new commands, not the same as the Old Testament, new commands, God has given us the wherewithal to be able to live up to what God expects of us. Amen? And he's kind and generous that if we don't, see in the Old Testament, if you didn't fulfill to the very iota, man, there was penalty. I mean, even high priest, as holy as he was, representing the people, going into the holy of holies, he had to have bells on the bottom of his, uh, of his robe so that the people could know as he went in there that he was still alive, they could hear the twinkle of the, of the bells. Because if he went in there with the wrong attitude, he wouldn't live. He'd die. And in the first place, all he could do is have a covering for sin temporarily. Next year, he had to go through the same old rigmarole again. So it's not that same kind of stringent burden and onus on you. It is new commandments. We're going to talk about them. Let's go to John 1.12, and we're going to see how we can live this new life. Can't do it by yourself. No one ever said you could. But as many as received him, to them, gave he the right or the power in one of the translations to become children of God and to those that believe in his name. So whatever God asks us to do, we're not under the same rigid requirement to do it like they were in the Old Testament. Now he puts it in our heart, in our mind, embeds it in our heart. And he gives us the desire to live for him. I can't say in the Old Testament, I read at least by far and large that people did these things for God because they wanted to and they loved to do it. No, it looked like they did it under a great duress. And in fact, it, over and over again, it was more than they could bear. They turned to some other God. God had a real problem with the Israelis because they wouldn't keep their faith in him. They always had to, had to have another God. They was finding a way out. They just couldn't handle it. But see, now in the New Testament, God has given us swear with all to do it. Hallelujah, we can do what we thought we couldn't do. Let's go to Romans 3.27. I want to show you there's two laws. Here it is. Who, who is boasting then? Is it, is it excluded? By what law? Of works. That's Old Testament. 
No, but by the law of faith. Everybody said amen so far? No one got afraid or anything so far? No one left the church, so praise God. No stones have been hurled. We give the praise for it. Now, while the believer, now watch closely because I'm going to try to break this down for you. While the believer is not under the law of Moses, he is under the law of Christ. What is that law? If you look at it through the Gospels, you'll find it's a code of conduct. God gives us a code of conduct. How should Christians live? How would we know if we didn't have direction? We would have all kind of wild ideas that Christians, some Christians do anyhow because they don't read the Bible. The Old Covenant required a rigid legal obedience to its commandments. The New Covenant requires a loving obedience to the commandments of Christ. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because, uh oh, where's greasy grace here? Because we keep his commandments. See, that, that doesn't, you know, grace doesn't give you license to, to, to live like the devil. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. It's a different motivation. You just have to understand the nuance of it. It's a different motivation. Then they did it out of rigorous requirement. Now we do it out of love. See, God, if any man be in Christ, we are a new creation. So what is that? What does that entail? Old things are passed away and become, all things become new. God instills within us the, the, the capacity to be able to please him. Not out of just sheer effort of will, but out of desire and love. Now you watch. We'll, we'll go down through this. As you get, if you get this, you'll have a lot. The old covenant gave us an external standard and obligated a strict and full compliance to it prior to the Messiah's coming. We know when Jesus came, he introduced a new covenant. He introduced the kingdom of God. And you remember John the Baptist told us that was going to happen as he was preaching in the wilderness. And then when Jesus came, it said he came preaching the kingdom of God. And so we are continuing the work that he began. If you're still here, say amen. amen. Now, the new covenant imparts an internal standard as well as the grace to be able to keep it. Now, let's look and we'll see that the code of standard is reasonable. And if we'll live by the code of, the code of standard that he gives us, we will live a more fulfilled life. We'll have less trouble, less conflict, less confusion. See, we want to kick against, you know, the Bible says kicking against the pricks. Like they, they're talking about, you know, resisting. But God doesn't want us to resist. He wants us to have a heart of love. And if we'll do that, it'll be to our benefit. Let's read Hebrews chapter 6 first. But now he's obtained a more excellent ministry. That's the new covenant. Inasmuch as he also is a mediator of a better covenant. Better. Also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. So everything about the new covenant is better. If there are anything from the old covenant that's inculcated in the new covenant, it's very clear. Very clear. And there are some things that stay in the Old Testament. We can read and study about it and so on, but they do not pertain to us in the same way that the New Covenant does. But whenever something out of the old contract applies to the present, it's very clear in the New Testament. And when that's there, then we accept that as a part of the New, the new Covenant. For if the first covenant had been faultless, it wouldn't have had to be a new one, right? Then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord. Now watch this. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. I think we'll one more verse now. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they did not continue in my covenant, I disregarded them, saith the Lord. See, people don't like me to use the term I do when I say a curse is upon 
all of Israel, except those who are Messianic Jews. And because it's because of disobedience, it's because of God came to them first. I remember Jesus said himself when he came, he said, I, I, I wanted to gather you like a hen gathers its chicks, but you would not. It was called stiff-necked and all kinds of names like that. And it brought great, great problems uh, upon, upon those because they couldn't live up to it. But if they had accepted the Messiah, they would have realized that what they could not do successfully in the Old Testament, they could do under the, the New Covenant. I know it's quiet, but it's okay. I'm used to it. Quiet or loud. <laughs> Praise God. All right. All, our, all of the managers, you're, you're the managers here. We're managers of the kingdom of God. Here's the code of ethics that God has laid down, the code of, of conduct that God has laid down. First of all, we know that Jesus gave numerous commandments. Let's look at a few. What did he say about loving God? Let's go to Matthew 22, 37. A lot of scripture because we have to prove it by the word. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Hey, that's good. With all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. God's not going to share Second place over your business, your spouse, your family, your grandchildren, and everybody else, and everything else that's precious to you. God said they got to take second place. You know, in the New Testament, sometimes the old, the old uh, King James, sometimes we get confused a little bit. It says, if you don't hate, they use the word hate, if you don't hate your your, your son or your daughter, you know, more than you do Christ. What it's saying, if you, if you don't love them less, love less. Not, you can love them a lot, but you got to love God more. Amen. He's got to be number, numero uno. Truth. Everybody can understand that. Even if you're not Spanish or Italian, you still understand. Number one. And we have to please him. Praise be to God. All right. So he says, first of all, so the first code of conduct for, for the managers of the kingdom is to love God. You can't be a successful Christian if you don't love God. I mean, love him. Yeah. Do you ever tell him you love him? Yeah. Oh, no, I only tell my wife. Oh, I only tell my children. Do you ever get intimate with God and say, Lord, I love you. I love you, Heavenly Father. I wonder if you could get some emotion in your heart and tell him how much you love him. All right, love God. How about your neighbor? <laughs> same, same. We're going to read a lot of these things in the 5th and 6th, 7th seven, chapter of Matthew right here. But this is in Matthew 2, and this is uh, uh, still in the 22nd, where, where am I at here? 22nd chapter, 39, uh, love our neighbor. Let's have to read it. And the second, see, first he gave us the first command. We have to love the Lord with everything you have. No reservations. Total abandonment. I love you, Father. That's it. I wonder if you could do this. I love you, Father, if I never got another benefit from you. Ooh, ooh, ooh. See, because we, we're, we're, my name's Jimmy. Take anything you give me. As long as you're, you're, <laughs> long as you're filling my hand, Lord. No, I, I mean, you can get the, but you know, I'll tell you the truth. I have a hard time getting my requests in because I become so enamored with telling him how much I love him and use, trying to find new words to do it and more ex expressions and whatever. It's almost time to quit praying. I haven't even put my requests in yet. <laughs> so I think you know what I mean. But here he is, he says, the second code of conduct to managers is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's never justifiable to hate your neighbor. You say, but Brother Dave, he runs over my grass, and you have no idea how hard I have. He's got, the, he's got his own lot, his parking area there. He's got his own driveway. Why does he? <laughs> well, because maybe he can't see good like you. <laughs> or maybe he was thinking of something else when he came in your driveway. But people will hate people or something like that. Recently, didn't you read in the paper with me where somebody shot? In fact, it was in the paper yesterday. It said that somebody called 911 and said, I just shot my neighbor. Some argument, some disagreement. And what a foolish thing to do. The neighbor, I think, in this case, gets shot in the stomach. I think the neighbor's going to live all right. 
but the guy who did it now, how many years is he going to spend in jail for doing that? So it's just foolish. We have to learn to love our neighbor. You say, well, I can love some neighbor. No, 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 no. No, no, no. I can love some neighbors because they're good to me. I can love some neighbors because they always look out for me. I don't care about that. Anybody can love people like that. People ask me all the time, do you love the people? I said, yes. Some people are easier to love than others. Some of you I have to work like the dickens <laughs> to, to love. Now, you know, you know what I mean now. Give Brother Dave a break here. I'm trying to be honest with you the best I can. So we have two, two code of ethics right here, a code of conduct, love God, then love our neighbor. How about witnessing? Matthew chapter 5. You, see, you're not just mere, you're not a mere person. You're more than that. You're somebody. Not because I say you're somebody. Not because you're somebody because you think you're somebody. You're somebody because of what he says. You are the salt of the earth. And if the salt loses its sa sa flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out, trampled underfoot by men. So we, we, we season. We're seasoning. Praise God. You are the light of the world. See, you're not just some happenstance. Oh, I was just born on the other side of the tracks. Where's that at, by the way? <laughs> I was born on the wrong side of the city. Where is that? Been looking for that wrong side. You're the light of the world. A city that is set up on a hill cannot be hidden. Now get this. This is instruction for managers. Are you getting it? Amen. All right. How about righteousness? Oh, I thought you could just live anything you, any way you wanted to. All you had to do is come to the altar and say, Lord, I accept you as my Savior. And then you go on and just do anything you wanted to and wouldn't have to have be, be guilty. Took all the guilt away. Well, let's see. Let's see what we have here. Let's uh, read it in Matthew chapter 5. Do not think that I came to destroy the law. Remember what I said earlier? He didn't come to destroy it. He came to fulfill it. Or the prophets, I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill. Because you couldn't fulfill it. I did it for you. Isn't that right? For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law until it's all been fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So while we can't do it perfect, we are to attempt with God's help to do everything we can to accomplish God's will in our life. Amen. If you have a bad habit and you, you've stubbed your toe again, go back to him and say, Father... I apologize. If we sin, we have an advocate. We have a personal attorney. And if we confess our sins, not just hide our sin, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Amen. So he knows all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But we should make every honest attempt to improve our own life for our own sake. If we would live according to the commandments of God, we'd be healthier. We'd be in more control of ourselves. Half the time, we're angry at somebody. What if we learned that I don't have to be mad? I don't have to be angry. I'm going to go in the mall. I'm going to be different. Every place I go, I see people going. <laughs> How about if we get in the mall and say, Just blink your eye a little bit there. People say, what's that? <laughs> They'll be so shocked. They're just used to seeing people with a furrowed brow, angry or afraid maybe. And the Bible says fear has torment, but perfect love casts out all fear. So I'm just trying to give you some help here today. <laughs> Best I can. How about reconciliation? Oh, Brother Dave, I'll tell you one thing. My family holds grudges, Brother Dave. No, I haven't talked to my sister for 37 years. <laughs> there are people like that. And I don't mean to make fun of you. I just have fun. I don't mean to make fun of anybody, but I'm just having a good time up here. But I've known a lot of people like that. And they think that rigidity of holding a grudge is some sort of a plus. Do you know that when you 
hate someone or you hold a grudge, you suffer the worst consequence. Generally speaking, people don't even realize what you feel about them. Boy, in your heart, you love them more. And you're killing yourself. It's the funniest thing in the world how that happens to us. So they tell us psychologically it does more damage to us. We'd be better off forgiving them and saying, hey, there are different, different strokes for different folks. I can't help what they do, but I can help what I do. So Matthew 5, see what it says about it. You've heard that it was said, uh, those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. All that real strong stuff. Now watch. But I say to you, I'm going to get down and nit, I'm going to nitpick with you, he says. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Rakab, I didn't look that up, and I don't know exactly what that means, but it shall, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, how many times did you call somebody a fool? Did you see this scripture lately? You fool shall be in danger of hellfire. I laugh because there's stuff in the Bible we don't even realize is there. Therefore, now watch this. How should the managers of the kingdom operate in this matter? Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way first to be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer the gift. Notice it doesn't say if you've wronged him. It, it implies that if he wronged you and he's avoiding you like a plague, the Bible says to go to that person. It's not easy because we are, our ego is too big. But we can go to a person and say, Jonathan, I apologize. I, I don't know what happened, but somehow things got out of hand and I just want you to know I love you as my brother and I want to reconcile with you. Almost everybody, there, there are some people who are so hateful they'd spit in your face, but almost everybody will respond to a kind apology, even when you're not at fault. Don't worry, they know they're the one at fault. They act like they don't know it, but in their heart they say, wow, what is this? I'm the one that started this thing. It don't matter who starts it. Managers of the kingdom know how to end it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm still up here preaching. Now I'm going to get into something's going to, you, now you get re, watch how quiet it gets. Now watch how quiet it gets. Because I'm going to talk about adultery and divorce. You hear it so seldom. Let's at least let the Bible speak for itself. There is a protocol. Let's let the Bible speak for itself. All right, we're in the fifth chapter, first of all. Same thing or in Matthew, 27 through 32 first. You have heard that it was said of old, you shall not commit adultery. Now watch how Jesus inculcates his own commandments as he looks at this idea about adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery for, with her in his heart. Wow. See, I never, I know, but what did you have in your heart? If your right eye calls you and so on, pluck it out, cast for you. So it just gives you some real perspective how serious this is, more profitable and all that. Let's go on because I want to get on down if your right hand causes you to sin. This is interesting. It doesn't mean to literally cut off your hand. This means to train it. So do right. All right, let's see. Now, what, where else did I want? I'm, I'm having a little problem right here with this. <laughs> All right, it's 37 through 40, so go on down. We, we need to go on down. Furthermore, it's been said, all right, here, here's where I wanted to get to. Whoever has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Now, that's what they're saying to Jesus. That's what we heard. <clears throat> Furthermore, it's been said, talking about what Ben said in the past, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Like that, that settled it. But I say to you, See, this is where the commands of Jesus come into play. Now, you can say, well, I can't accept that. It's fine. You're a creature of choice. You don't have to accept anything that's, that's, that's very obvious here. But I say to whoever divorces his wife, now watch the exception. There is an exclusionary cause here, and I want you to watch it. 
Whoever divorces his wife for any reason except, that means it's an exception, exclusionary, except sexual immorality. Now notice it doesn't say whoever divorces his wife because she tried to take a shower every other day. I thought she should take one every day. <laughs> Are there still people that take a shower every other day? I, don't, I haven't noticed it lately, but anyhow. <laughs> I'd rather be shot than do that. But anyhow. Now, we're in this serious business. But I say, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. What is adultery? Adultery is a sin against God. See, adultery is different than stealing. Adultery is a sin of the spirit. Stealing is a sin of the mind, sin of lust, or desire for somebody, what somebody else has. But in the, in, in, in this is why. When intimacy happens between a man and a woman, they bond. Spiritual bond. Even if you're already married. And you or with someone else. That's what breaks the bond with the existing marriage and forms another bond. Not that it's legal, it's totally illegal, spiritually speaking. Causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Now, let's see where we're at. We're in, uh, now I want us to go to another portion of scripture on that. Let's go to the 19th chapter, because he, he reiterates, so we, we get it clear. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished his saying, then he departed from Galilee, came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees all came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to... Boy, this people, they wanted to find out if they had an out. Maybe if you had made the right choice to start with, you wouldn't be so anxious to want to get out of the relationship you're in. Help me, Jesus. I don't know whether I'm... Getting any, I don't know if I'm getting any traction here or not. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? They didn't like that exclusionary business. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Notice he didn't make them male and male. It's an abomination before God that they got into our Supreme Court and got a ruling that made it legal for a man to marry a man. That is an abomination before God. They could live together, do anything they want to, do, but try to make that legal and moral is unbelievable. You know, everybody knows that this has been going on from time immemorial. We know all about the sins of the flesh and so on. But what the immoralists, people that are immoral, have done, they've tried to shove it down our throats. They want you... They don't only want to do what they do. They want you to accept it and herald it. You better be for it. And look what else has happened. Now, poor transgenders who don't know for sure who they are have to be able to, if that day they wake up, I know you read it in the paper, but it's too much for me to pass over. Forgive, Brother Dave. I don't know why, to see some burly guy coming into a girl's restroom. And you know that most of the states aren't going to take it. They're going to take the president to the court on this. Yeah. You just have to appreciate you grandparents and you people that have children, have little children. Can you just imagine every school? Imagine they're making this, they're, they're making this a law in the schools, all the educational system, high school and college. And uh, let's just pray that it won't go anywhere. For this reason, now watch, he, he, we're going back to the divorce thing. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. See, that's why I say it's spiritual, not just physical. It's a bond that happens, it's a covenant. So then, they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man put or separate. Let no man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses commit, a, a, a commit to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? Why did Moses? Because they were driving him crazy. He didn't know what else to do. 
He didn't ask God. He just said, hey, hey, write something. Write it down. Just say, I give her up. I don't want her anymore. And he said that Moses, because of the hardness, your hearts permitted you to divorce your wife. But from the beginning, it was not so. It never was God's will. And I say to you, whoever, now watch, here we go again, the exclusionary causes here. For I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except, everybody say except. That means that excludes it. Except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery, and forever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. We have to understand, folks, if you're the guilty party, if you're the one that initiated, okay, you had your reason, oh, I hear, I've heard it all. Brother Dave, I have no idea what she, what this was. Yeah, I know. You ought to hear what she says about you. <laughs> no, you know, this is serious, brother. And, and so, so you're the party, and so you decide, well, I'm going to see if the grass is greener on the other side. And you commit adultery with another woman. You're the guilty party. Amen. You're the guilty party. And God holds you responsible for not only your sin, for the sin you're, you're causing to happen to the woman you're with, and the sin that you're bringing upon your own life. Now, let me show you the out, because remember we said there's an exclusion. So I'm going to take you over to 1 Corinthians 7. I want to show you something. Because the innocent party is not under bondage in such cases. That means if a guilty party has gone out and committed adultery with another woman, and you're the woman, or if you committed adultery with another man, you're the, you're the, you're the, you're the, you're the, you're the, you're the husband, then you have a right to divorce her. Now, I don't say you should. It's just a right. You have an option. If you can make it, now there's plenty that's in the Bible. For instance, let me, let me give you some. This is in the seventh chapter. I'm taking more time than I wanted to on this, but I don't want you to be unclear about it. Now, to, here's Paul. He, he deals with it in the seventh chapter. He begins to elucidate on it. In the tenth verse, seventh chapter, he says, Now to the married I commend, yet not I, but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried. This is a case where she does not have the exclusion. She does, she, there's no adultery. She just wants to leave her husband. He beat her. He was mean. He was this or that. He wasn't a good provider. He alcoholic, whatever you want. Now, she can leave him, but there's no exclusion there. You can divorce him. You can leave them, but you're not free to remarry as long as they're alive. And I know it's a strange thing, but watch this. Even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried until she be reconciled to her husband, and the husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest, Paul begins to explain. He says, I say, if, here it is, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let her not divorce him. Because <clears throat> you have influence on him. And do you know that you sanctify now, he won't go to heaven on this, but you sanctify him by you being a Christian even though he isn't. And then when you have children from him, your children are sanctified because of your relationship with God. This is amazing, folks. This is good stuff. For the rest, I not, if, if any brother or wife does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let her, him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, and he's willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. Now watch. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But now they are holy. Isn't that good of God? Amen. Now watch this next part. Here's, the, here's where the exclusion comes in. If the guilty party refuses, and you want to reconcile, and they refuse. If the unbeliever depart, because he's an unbeliever, if he has violated that basic code, that basic covenant, he, and he's out there with someone else, I, believe me, he's become an unbeliever. He's not living according to the scriptures. And it says, if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. Now watch this part. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but the God has called us to peace. How about that? So here's the thing. People who are innocent deserve the right to know that God doesn't deal with them the same as he does with those who are the guilty party. But what I would do if I was the innocent party, I would go to the Lord and just to make sure say, Lord, I feel like I did everything I could to make this marriage work. 
But what I would do if I was honest, I would say, Lord, forgive me for anything I did that hurt this marriage, if something I missed, something I didn't do, should have done, or did do and shouldn't have done, whatever it is, Lord, please forgive me because you want to make sure you're clean as you go on with your life and perhaps even into another marriage, which you can do legitimately from the Scripture. Why? Because of the exclusionary thing. Accept it. That means that it's not the same. As soon as that happens, the bond's been broken. Then you need reconciliation. It's not easy because it's very difficult to forget that someone stepped out on you. Very difficult to forget that someone has broken your heart. And if you're a woman, you feel like he's rejected. You may not say this, but you feel rejected. Not good enough. You know, because when a person leaves you, he makes or she makes excuses. And you ought to hear the excuses. I should write a book on the excuses that people have for leaving their marriage. Don't get mad at Brother Dave. I'm just trying to help us here. All right, let me go on here. I had enough time on that. Now, if you have other questions, I can talk to you another time about it. How about making oaths, making these vows? Let's look at Matthew 5, 33 through 37. Did you notice all the ears that were perked way up? As soon as I started about another thing, they just relaxed. <laughs> I, I just noticed little things like that. I don't know why. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old. Notice it keeps referring to how people made excuses in the old, how they got around things. He said, it's been said in the old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all. I swear by my mother's grave. Don't you ever say that again. You shouldn't have to swear to prove you're telling the truth. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, and on, nor by earth, for it's his footstool, nor of Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Boy, you're getting a lot of good stuff here today. I know. I can tell. I can tell. I'm getting you. I got you. I got you. How about retaliation? Let's look at something else. Let's go to Matthew again. Five. You have heard that it was said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. They hit me on one side. I'm going to hit them with my fist three times. Every time Israel has a deal, you hit us once. We hit you ten times. You come and do some kind of thing and you try to kill somebody here, we'll find out what your, who your family is. We're going to come over and burn your family's house down. Whoo, that make parents responsible, wouldn't it? Say, well, I don't believe that. Well, did you ever notice that Al, Al has never had a plane go down because of somebody putting a bomb on it? Did you ever try to find The safest airline in the world is El Al. That's the Jerusalem and the Israeli plane. They know how to watch. They know how to you're so quiet. Hey, they're good people. They know how to exist. If, you, if everybody around you is your enemy trying to kill you and extinguish, extinguish you, boy, you'd find ways to stay alive out there, and they have learned it. All right, now I tell you not to resist any food, but whoever slaps you, oh, oh Lord. <laughs> you hotheads, just, just try, to, try to humor yourself here for a minute. I tell you, whoever slaps you on the right cheek, Turn your other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you, take away your tunic, let him have your coat also. Give me those shoes you have on. Here, take this jacket too. Take these size 12. You're only wearing seven. You're going to swim in my shoes. <laughs> <clears throat> Retaliation. How about enemy? How do we handle with enemy? Let's go again to the fifth chapter. We're talking about enemies. Well, this is, you have heard that it was said. See, you've heard, you've heard, you've heard all these old say, all these old sayings. You heard a lot of things you thought the Bible said was never in it. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Doesn't that sound logical? Hey, love your, hate them enemies, man, I'm telling you. But I say to you, oh, here it comes. Code of conduct, managers. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, oh my, and do good to those that hate you, I'm feeling it, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. It's like he rubs it in, like you rub salt into a cut. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun shine on the evil and on the good and sends rain upon the just and the unjust. We're not God. 
It's up to God to decide punishment, not us. See, that's not gone over too well, Brother Dave. I know it. I'm at my microphone don't even like it. It's trying to get away from my mouth. <laughs> what about trying to be perfect? Look at, look at this. This is Matthew 5.48. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Every effort ought to be made to live by this conduct, by this, this, this etiquette. Let's see, what else? Values, because everybody wants to be rich. Let's go to Matthew 6. We're in the six, is this six, or is that? Go to Matthew chapter 6 this time, and we're in verse 16. Okay, oh, that's, that's good. Say really. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. It doesn't matter. People, people are driving you nuts on TV right now. Turn your IRAs into gold. Buy gold. Every bank is buying silver, so you should buy silver. They bought 5,000 tons of silver last month at this bank. You should buy. What are we going to do with it? Where are we going to put it? <laughs> you can't put it in the bank because you can't trust the bank. Oh, my God. What if they break in your house? Oh, my Lord. You know it's a joke. I mean, we're living in a very strange time, I tell you for sure. One guy's out there harping up there, man, they're going to have the biggest recession ever had in the history of the world. And this guy said, man, put your money here, man. Going... Oh, boy. That's why it says, do not lay up yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. And maybe even the government can take over your bank account. That's what I've read. He said, I saw that too, brother. They might even believe it. I know I don't want to believe it either. They said this time when the, when the thing goes under, instead of the bank, you know, doing the toxic homes and all that and taking homes back, they're going to go in your bank account. God. What is that? Bank account. I used to hear those things before. Lay up yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break seal. That's why when you work, there's nothing, nothing wrong with a dream, nothing wrong with aspiration, nothing wrong with working hard. As long as you're paying your tithes and you care about, the, the, there's going to be a place we might not, oh, I might not get to it, but alms, you know, that's not tithe, by the way. That's, that's just been a, like somebody wants to say, I'm going to take that guy out to dinner. Or I'm going to pick up that check. Or I'm going to help someone with, that's not tithe. If you include that as tithe, it, don't, it doesn't count. Alms are separate. Tithe is a tithe. Tithe belongs in the church. That belongs in the place where you get fed, where you believe. There's, and so it's just very clear if you do it otherwise. So the Bible warns that if you just, if you don't have the right attitude, you can have a lot. There's nothing wrong with having a big home, big car, anything, as long as you're putting God first. And you have a sensitivity toward the needy. And you're open to that. In some way, you share with others the best you can. Otherwise... You'll work all your life, and you'll gather, and you'll struggle, and you'll put it together, and you'll look at it, and you'll multiply it, and you'll invest it, and you'll do this, and you'll have all this, and then you find out that you can't take it with you. <laughs> oh, no. I thought, just like the one guy, he was so enamored with being rich. This is serious. I already read this where a guy was so serious, and at that time, the Cadillac was the thing. He had this big Cadillac, and he drove it all his life. He always had a new Cadillac and so on. And he wanted to be buried, if he had to die, in his Cadillac. And they did. The suckers dug, dug a big hole. He had the ground where he could do it, and they just buried that whole thing in it. <laughs> Don't be like the lady, though. She was trying to be real good. Husband there were laying in the grave. And, uh, you know, they had, she had she'd learned all her life is supposed to be half and half. So she put a piece of paper in, in the casket, walked away. So later on, the guy that from the funeral home, he went, I said, I wonder what that is. And he looked at it, and it was a check for $25,000 made out to him. <laughs> I wanted you to have something to laugh. When you go to eat, I don't want you to be tense when you go to eat. You know, some people don't like the way I am, but I can't help it. I just enjoy preaching, and sometimes things come to mind. I just love it. I just... All right, let me, let me wrap it up because I only have about five minutes to do this. <clears throat> While salvation is by grace through faith, the new covenant believer who loves Jesus will voluntarily and sequaciously, you know, I'm with me with words, this means obediently, 
use every effort to keep his commandments. I know you can't do it perfect, but you're going to feel good about yourself if you're trying the best you can. The oath of the new covenant. You remember, as no, the Noahic, Abrahamic, and Davidic covenants were confirmed by oaths. There always was a vow, an oath. So also is the new covenant. The oath of this covenant is particularly focused on the priesthood of Christ. Without him, it would be no covenant. Because the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant were preparatory to the new covenant, their king priesthood finds its fulfillment in Jesus. That's why those that look forward always look to Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith. They may not have known him personally like they found out later, but they believed that he was coming and they were ready to receive. My, isn't this good? Let's give the Lord a hand of praise for the word of God. <clears throat>